All right, I think we're going to get going. How's everybody doing this afternoon? Excellent. Welcome to a step back in time through the dynasties. This year we're going to have a look through uh, the Qing Dynasty, the Ming Dynasty, and going all the way back to the Tai Tong Dynasty. Last year when we did our performance, everything that was worn was actual Qing Dynasty pieces, but uh, due to the fact that the Ming Dynasty and the Tang Dynasty go so far back in history, we've uh, done our best to bring before you as authentic uh, reproductions as possible. Uh, going into detail with makeup, uh, hairstyles, and uh, the actual costumes themselves. First we'll be talking about our uh, makeup demonstration. My wife Joy will be presenting to you the various makeups that uh, women in ancient times had worn. She has here uh, a collection of different sorts of makeup that were made according to actual ancient recipes that uh, we've come upon. And uh, in a little bit you'll have a chance to come up and talk to her a little bit more about it. Perhaps even have a smell of some of the makeups. Uh, she is wearing a reproduction Ming Dynasty gown. The Ming Dynasty was the ruling dynasty of China from 1368 to 1644. This was the last dynasty ruled by the ethnic Han people. Women during the Ming Dynasty had a relatively low status. Unmarried girls would have only inherited a small part of uh, their family heritage and married women were, for all intents and purposes, considered the property of their husbands. However, the laws of the Ming Dynasty did provide for women some rights, such as uh, divorce. Foot binding was uh, widely practiced during the Ming Dynasty because people considered uh, smaller feet to be more attractive and uh, as a symbol of status for the women and uh, showed that they didn't have to work to provide for their living, obviously because it was imp impossible for them to work with uh, such feet. Women with uh, regularly sized feet would have had trouble marrying, and uh, the parents would have started binding their feet at the age of five in order to sort of assure them a uh, higher marriage prospect as the husband's wives would have come around and checked out the women's feet for their uh, newborn son. Luckily, these customs did not follow into modern days. <clears throat> we'll talk about makeup a little bit. In the Tang Dynasty, which went from 618 to 906 AD, a seven-step beautification process for fashionable Chinese women would have included applying powders, darkening of the eyebrows, the painting of dimples, and applying a shiny gold foil to the forehead. Chinese women favored were favored if they were shorter, with pale skin, bright eyes, and white teeth. The makeup back then by today's standards would have been alarming. You can see her eyebrows here, uh, painted as kind of feathers and very intense angles. The typical look was uh, bushy, sprawling eyebrows, long slanted eyes, pouting lips, and an expansive coating of ro rouge on the cheeks and dainty flowers painted on the forehead. Especially in the Tang Dynasty, there were seven steps to the applying of cosmetics. First, they would have applied a powder base, then they would have applied color to their face, eyebrow darkening would have come next, and then a uh, forehead gold, a floral gold, as you can see on these two young ladies here. Uh, they would have then painted on the dimples, decorated the cheeks, and lastly applied the lip color. The ancient Chinese began to stain their nails with gum, gelatin, beeswax, and egg. This was an early form of nail polish. The colors used would have represented their social classes. For instance, during the Cho Dynasty, the royals would have worn gold and silver, with the subsequent royals wearing black or red. The lower classes were forbidden to color their nails with bright colors. Women would have used rice powder to make their faces white and henna dyes to stain their hair. 
women would have glued gold, silver, jewels, and jade flakes to their forehead, around the eyes and cheeks. The materials used to stick to the cheeks were, would have been all kinds of things, such as dragonfly wings, bird feathers, and fish scales. This sort of practice began when uh, a princess, Shouyang, woke up with a plum flower printed on her forehead and cheeks. It stayed on there for three days, and her maids began drawing flowers on their faces too, and from there it became fashionable to have flowers drawn on the face. During the Tang Dynasty, women would have scraped off their eyebrows and drawn them on instead of instead using a thing called dye, which is a black pigment. In ancient China, lip gloss was made of vermilion minerals and animal grease. The ancient Chinese favored the cherry-like small lips, which you can kind of see on there, a little red in the middle there. Next, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some calligraphy. We're lucky to have with us today Hongli Shu, who is a painter, calligrapher, and a graphic designer. He himself was a very proficient calligrapher. She's wearing a uh, reproduction Ming Dynasty gown. She'll be showcasing a little bit of her calligraphy work, and uh, all of these pieces she's drawn drawn herself uh, this morning. Unfortunately, she's not able to bring inks with her here, obviously, because with such priceless artifacts around us, it's not good to have the chance of staining those with ink. But she does have uh, a pad here, which uh, she will use in water to sort of demonstrate the calligraphy techniques. And Calligraphy established itself as the most important Chinese art form, alongside painting, first coming to the forefront during the Han Dynasty in 206 BC to 220 AD. All educated men and some court women were expected to be proficient at it, an expectation which remains even today. Far more than just writing, Good calligraphy exhibits an exquisite brush control and attention to composition, and the actual manner of writing is very important and uh, sums up the internal workings of the person. A, a good calligrapher is said to have a very calm inner nature and is a cultivated person. And this is expressed through uh, rapid, spontaneous strokes being the ideal. The brushwork of calligraphy, its philosophy and materials, but influenced Chinese painting styles, especially landscape paintings, and many of the ancient scripts are still imitated, imitated today in modern Chinese writing. It's the ox word. Sorry. The highly flexible brushes used in calligraphy were made from animal hair, or at times even feathers, cut to a tapering end and tied to a bamboo or wooden handle. So the brushes that she has here uh, would be made from different materials. Uh, I'm not exactly sure which ones. You can come up here in a little bit, maybe talk to her a little bit about that. The ink would have been made actually by the calligrapher themselves. They would have used all kinds of different materials, which have been made into sort of uh, stone, who helped development of more artistic styles of calligraphy because of its absorbency capturing every nuance and brushstroke. A connoisseurship quickly developed and calligraphy became one of the six classic ancient arts alongside ritual, music, archery, and charioteering, and mathematics. It's on the page to create an aesthetically pleasing form. Welcome all today. Um, I'd like to first point something out that we didn't show off earlier, showcase earlier. I actually have with me a lovely lady. She, what she's wearing is actually from the Qing Dynasty, and what she's wearing from head to toe is actually my personal collection. Um, antique, hand bordered gown worn by Han women. So Qing Dynasty is from 1600s until 1911. And her hair pieces, which I absolutely love, they're called Kingfisher feather hairpins. 
point these out. They're very brilliant blue, and they're actually made with kingfisher feather pins. Uh, they're, it's actually a very beautiful but very cruel art style because they pluck the feathers of the kingfisher birds when they're alive, and it takes about seven or eight birds to make one hair pieces. And it was so popular in Chinese history that a lot of um, kingfishers went extinct. I just love pointing that out. It's beautiful but very cool. And to have a piece intact, I find that like very amazing. It's really awesome. So if you guys want to come up after I'm done talking, you just kind of see her outfit in detail. It's beautiful. And her gown is hand embroidered and usually takes seven or eight, sometimes more, um, women that would order from morning to night. And it's really, really hard on their eyes because it's very, very fine detail. And sometimes they have a very short career and if they're in border, they would probably go blind within a few years. They do it in the, in the moonlight as well. And as you can imagine, there's no electricity. Very, very hard to see. So it's a really, really awesome piece. So please come up and check this out. Um, I like to talk about Chinese makeup. And what I have up here is very, very special. I found a company in China that uses the same ingredients from 150 years ago. And their company has been open for 150 years. And I was really, really lucky to get my hands on some really authentic makeup from back in the old days, made in the exact same way. Now, powders back then was made by rice flour, ground up very fine, and it has very, very good skin. There is this luxury company now, which is very popular in Japan, called SK2 which is fermented rice. I'm not sure if you guys heard of that company before. So this is actually, I thought, a very cheaper, much cheaper, but much more organic way of doing it because each individual pearl, as you can see, is actually made out of fermented rice, dried and re-fermented seven times. And the craft of this, I still can't believe it, they still do this by hand. And only one company will produce it. And what you do is you take one or two pearls in your hands, you wet it with water, then kind of just pinch in your fingers and it creates, creates this beautiful fine paste. Now you can use this as a makeup base. It's a little chunky, so I would recommend for that. But it is fantastic. If you're really super hot in the summer and you want something to do to cool your skin off and kind of like, you know, dry off the oil spots in your face, these are fantastic. I've tried it. And as far as rouge, they're made out of actually dried rose powders and flour which I have some, and they all smell fantastic, made of various flower oils, essential oils, it's really awesome. And back in the old days, women did not have hairspray. They used sesame seed oil mixed with various different flower essences, which I have a bottle of. So it'll be really cool if you guys want to come and try this out. All right, thank you so much. And make sure to check us out um, at 2.30. I think it's 2.30. 2.45. 2.45. 2.45. 2.45. 2.45. We have um, fantastic performances by these ladies, professional dancers and singers. They're a fantastic, amazing dancers. We would love if you could join us downstairs at Kirkwood Hall. Thank you. Thank you very much. Feel free to come up and have a look.